a bit of humour attached to, to, to the topic when we talk about gut strings because uh, people think it's so disgusting, but, but really it's not that bad. Uh, I think the whole business of stringing is really essential to the um, understanding of the historical development of the of the violin from various ancestor instruments and so on. But it's also you know, quite a lot of people work on Baroque setups, and I think very often Baroque setup is crap. It's done without any kind of research, and it's as much the, the fault of the musicians who want it as, as luthiers who haven't have done their homework. Uh, but anyway, I'm very opinionated uh, about this. So if people come to me wanting sort of compromise type work on the historical setup, I don't really want to do it. I, I only want to work with people who are uh, committed to, um, you know, treating the evidence uh, as as real and taking it as, as far as they can. Uh, if they don't like that, then they can go to somebody else. Do I sound grumpy? Um, we just, I have to just move this list of pictures there. There we go. Um, so this is a, an old string um, timeline that I've generated years ago. I've just recently, oops, recently modified it. Uh, but historically, there's uh, there's sort of gut strings that exist. You know, who knows how far back they go, but but you know, a long time. But uh, around about the 1500s, sort of improved bass strings became available, and they got better through the period up until you know through through the early 1600s and so on. Um, so that we have what's called a, I call a golden age of gut, when all strings were strung in all gut equal tension. Um, and this is like a, a period of, of nearly you know 200 years. But the although uh, overspinning like the white putting uh, uh, wrapping the string with a, a piece of uh, wire metal wire you know it's first reported in uh, in about uh, 1659 it wasn't really common i mean it was a, occasional use on instruments or in particular places and even when the strings came in they were um actually mostly core with a small amount of winding and in, in some cases a core with, with an open winding that's with a space between it uh, as as in some of these surviving uh, Stradivari viola strings. So the, the, the kind of modern uh, idea of a wound string with a core at about 60% of its breaking strain and, and, a, and a maximum amount of uh, um, mass added by the winding, you know, that was not the case uh, in these uh, earlier wound strings. So in a sense, the aesthetic of the all gut actually persists for longer than people really imagine. But uh, toward, in the second, uh, certainly the last quarter of the um, 18th century, things changed uh, quite dramatically for violins, but not really for um, the other instruments. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through these slides. So, there's things that people complain about with gut strings, and, and some of these things are, apply to other strings as well. So a, a string that breaks too soon is a nuisance. I mean, you know, they, if they cost a lot of money, or they break in the middle of a performance. So that's to say the rupture modulus is not great enough, but rupture modulus and elastic modulus are not the same thing. So uh, an elastic modulus can allow something to deform a, um, a long way, so it describes the force that it takes to deform something like, as in, in Hooke's law, you, know, you had a, a mass on a spring, and the spring deforms proportionate to the mass that you uh, apply to it, but there comes a point where it uh, that system breaks down and, and the spring deforms or the material breaks. Uh, an, another problem is, is the pitch. Pitch goes up. It's called pitch distortion. So that can happen with a uh, with a, a gut string that doesn't have the right construction for the task it's been given. But it can happen, say, in a, a cheap uh, overspun string that has a solid uh, steel core. Uh, so it's the string is simply not stretchy enough. So that, that's a confusing, really, because uh, 
we actually want the elastic modulus of the string to be not too high. Uh, but we do want the rupture modulus to be high, but we want the elastic modulus to be moderate. So if it's ridiculously low, the string will be flapping around all over the place, and that would be a, another problem. But we want it within a, within a practical range. Obviously, strings that won't stay in tune is a problem, and, and that happens in gut strings if, for example, hygroscopic chemicals have not been removed, or if the material is creeping, i.e. perhaps the gut was uh, exposed to bacteria action during its processing or it was, um, you know, not well, not well dried. Uh, false strings mean it means that the harmonics are not in tune with the fundamental, uh, as in this uh, picture at the bottom here. I forget where this comes from. I think it may be in Diderot, Diderot Encyclopedia. Somebody else probably knows. So if if you actually hold the string between two ends and pluck it, the the envelope is clear. The out the two extremes show up as a line uh, and the space in between is clear, but if it's false, there's a, there's a kind of fuzz in between. And, and the reasons for this are un, uneven distribution of properties and that can be mass bend, or bending stiffness. And then if they're difficult to articulate, you see, you try to bow them and there's a long scratchy starting transient that's often a symptom of the string simply being too, too stiff in, in bending. It's probably also um, elastic modulus too high as well. And here, here's a set of uh, misconceptions, like that thinner strings can be tuned higher. So um, breaking point is uh, not, you know, from a uniform material, the breaking point is not related to diameter because both the, uh, um, the rupture modulus and tension per unit area are, are in the same linear proportion to the cross section. So we got rid of that one. Uh, high tensions are difficult to play. Uh, yes, if they really are excessive, so you can end up into, in a minimum bow force regime, the difficulty of having any range of, um, you know, uh, of expression. But normally when, when you reach that uh, that region, you're also in the region where the tensions are actually a little bit too much for the structure of the instrument. And you get kind of neck sinking or other, other structural problems. It's also believed that gut, gut is less stable than uh, metal synthetics. But I, I, I say unto thee, which gut? Because if gut is actually well processed and the um, unwanted residual materials removed, uh, it's past the creep stage, and then actually it's every bit as stable as other, other materials. I had a client who played on a, a cello in the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. He played on all gut, a, a, all gut uh, C string on his cello, and he, had, he did not have any more problems keeping in tune than people with, um, with their spiracles and other synthetic strings. Another one that really makes me mad is this thing about Baroque instruments are strung much more lightly than modern instruments. It is simply not true. The evidence is not out there. It's something that's just been plucked out of the air by somebody and it's stuck like dog shit on your shoe. Um, and and uh, this other one about the grading of string tensions. So we get started with a high tension of the stop, top string and getting less with the bottom. This is another evidence-free assumption. Like it is true that this happened to be was the case for um, violins in the late 18th, um, late 17th century. 18th century. Let's get my centuries right. But actually, even today, it's not it's not true of all instruments. I think we'll come back to, to that in a minute. Uh, and then this other one, we, we touched on that earlier in the week about taller bridges increasing tension. No, tension is the force uh, axially along the string. Uh, the for downward force of the bridge is the resolved tension as a result of the angle that it, it goes around. Uh, so when people say tension, they're talking about something quite different. What's this one? 
but uh, central to our understanding of um, stringing is, is this Mersenne Taylor formula. That a Mersenne, sometime in the 1600s, got it sort of almost right, but then the English physicist uh, Taylor kind of polished it up into the into its modern form. So uh, frequency is, is the frequency in hertz. Uh, L is the length. Uh, T is the tension, and this idea of mu is the mass per unit length, but it in, incorporates into that the cross-sectional area and the density of the material. If we look, if we compare this to the um, formula for a beam, we can see they both contain L and they also can uh, have the square root. So in fact, E times I is equivalent, equivalent to T. So E is the elastic modulus of the material and I is the uh, moment of inertia, which is a, a descriptor of how the uh, stresses will be distributed in its cross section and, and row at the bottom is density. So this little part of the formula is equivalent to that one um, and this part to this. But uh, the difference between th this is for a beam simply supported on the end. So it's saying the ends can can hinge and move uh, in that the, they can rotate, but they can't. Um, they're not free to, to, to flap about like when the beam is freely supported. But the, the uh, very important difference between these two is that the uh, velocity of the of a wave in the string is constant, just like uh, in the banjo uh, head, which Jim talked about on on Monday. So the string and the stretch membrane are same in that respect. They're always subsonic, but in the beam, each time you go up into the next mode in the sequence. The frequency is not a multiple of the fundamental. The, the wave speed gets uh, gets faster as, as you go up in frequency. So the consequence of this is, is that uh, strings are in part, they're, they're partly this one and they're partly this one. So the, the thicker the string uh, in proportion to its tension and length, the, the bigger the bigger the simply supported beam component becomes in it has bending stiffness and the fundamentals are pushed sharp in, in relation to the fundamental frequency and we get a string that doesn't doesn't work so well i mean uh John, the top strings are is a, sorry sorry there's just a question from yeah. ada she wants to know what is new it's a lineage mass, the oh, mass uh, the i did say but uh M mu is the mass per mass per unit length, but what what it means is that that if you for any given cross sectional area and density, um, or or you could look at it another way, you know, take a centimeter length of the string, how much does it weigh? So if for a denser material, the frequency goes down. Or, or it goes down for the, the same material with a bigger cross-sectional area for the same tension. Is that is that a good enough answer? Apparently it is. So let's move on. Um, so uh, there's the the real gut string calculator, which is something I I wrote this application probably around about in around about two thousand. Uh, to cope with uh, string customers and their needs. So uh, what it does is it keeps a, a record that you can keep in file of a particular stringing profile. And I can include in it all kinds of information, like the, the note name, its frequency, the pitch standard, the di uh, diameter in millimeters. And if I want to compare it with that in, in thou, because some people insist on um, discussing their string diameters in, in thousands of an inch and other people still use the PM or parastro measure. I express the tension in kilograms. Um, I mean you can, uh, some people prefer to do it in newtons. I don't know, I'm not very comfortable with newtons. I'm, you know, I'm only selling strings to people on planet Earth, not, not the moon or Mars. 
But if that were the case, then kilograms would start to be not so relevant. We'd have to use newtons. And I can set up, when I change one parameter, I can specify what else is recalculated. So if I want to say, um, if I want to tune it up a semitone but keep the same tension, what will the diameter be? Or I can say, if I change the string uh, stop from 90 to 95, how will that affect the tension? And I can input the pitch by from this little virtual keyboard. I can choose the octave. I can choose the, from um, a set of common pitch standards, or I can type my own in, and then I can modify it in sense. But in reality, the the precision of this, I can it's calculated in the 32-bit floating point numbers which gives a precision which is insanely excessive because you simply can't measure a string in that uh, to that precision uh, and actually you're not really sensitive to a couple of percent uh, in, in difference in diameter but this you can if you need to you can I can give you a copy of this uh, calculator or you can program it into an Excel sheet from from that um, Mercer and Taylor formula that I, I gave you. Oops. So this, um, you know, for historical stringing, this uh, principle of equal, equal tension dates back a, a very long time. And that's to say that to have a, an instrument that is balanced, you know, this, this is the prerequisite to, to make the strings sound even. Um, now the reasons there are reasons why that's different for the the um, you know late late 1700s uh, violin stringing that, that's another topic but there, there's actually I've quoted cited two pieces of evidence here of um, Leopold uh, Mozart in his book of um, 1759 explicitly says to to get uh, in order to make strings su suitable for your violin you must take two of them hang them with equal weights and when you strike them they sound a perfect fifth so i don't think you can get more explicit than that uh this guy an italian guy stefano de colco has a in his book he has an engraving of um something that looks like a lute with with uh, the strings come over the edge of the table at the end and they have weights on so he, he was setting the um he was testing them in, in exactly the same way. Now it's actually possible that lutes were a little bit different because the uh, the main most important lutes was the feel to the person plucking them. You, you sometimes got a lot of strings to pass over while you're playing and if they, each one of them requires a different uh, amount of effort to pluck, uh, it's very disrupting for, for the player but they also have to um, set the heights carefully. So that, um, this is one of the reasons why the bridges have, have, have a hole uh, and they don't have a, have a saddle, but you can adjust this, uh, the heights of the strings so that as you pluck them, you get them, uh, strike them equally. And that's particularly important, say, if you have octave stringing. Uh, Dowland writes that they, they must be neither too hard nor too weak and so on. And there's, there's another um, one of these uh, statements that, that refers to, um, to, be, to being like a man running over uneven ground. So if you're running and you want to run fast, it's, you know, nice smooth grass is, is ideal. But if the, if it's kind of rocky and there are holes and things, you you'll stumble and and you'll make make mistakes while you're playing. So equal tension. John, each string has exactly. Yes. Hi. Yes, Claudia. She's gone, but uh, maybe I, Joel asked a question. Uh, he said, "How do you take into account the diameter reducing in tension?" With tension. Aha. Yes, thanks, Tim, for asking the question. There's a just phone. Be patient. Uh, tell him to be patient. I'm going to tell him that in a minute. Right. So, equal tension. 
it, it's like the, the purple ones and uneven tension is, is, is they're graded and they get less as you go across. So if I look um, at some standard sets like um, Dario uh, kindly uh, publish um, their, uh, a lot of their string tensions, I think all of them, but unfortunately they're in pounds and I, I, uh, I couldn't be bothered to create tables where I've converted them into, into kilograms or newtons or whatever. Um, but what we're looking at here, uh, uh, double bass contrabass. Yeah, so uh, in the standard spiracor set, uh, the top, top string has a 30.5 kilogram tension and they go up as you go down. So it's the opposite way around uh, to, um, to a graded violin set. Uh, and the dominant cello set, the A is quite a bit more than the uh, D and G, but the G is a little bit more than the D, and the C is more than either of those. So actually the history of uh, uneven cello sets goes, goes back definitely to into the 19th century with, um, what's his name? Oh, I can't remember his name. Come back, might, might come back to me. But he, he sometimes uses very, very high string tensions. And they often, in that time, people often made the G less, uh, less tension than the other strings. And the reason for that is because the uh, A0 mode lies in the, in the G, and the G is a, a naturally powerful string on the cello. So they often balance that out by making it a bit less. But it still starts around the concept of equal tension and how you might need to deviate from that to, to get a good result. Um, so if you're looking at violins and equal tension sets, this is very much the sort of thing I would sell to people. So my, my starting concept is that we're, we're at a pitch standard of 415, which actually is a load of nonsense because there was never any such pitch standard. And the whole question of what pitch standards were used in violins to, to me is still a very open question. But this is what a lot of people do. I mean, that's their business. They get employed to play in ensembles that uh, play at 415. And of course, that's when you play with uh, wind instruments and organs. Uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't play around and play on a different pitch standard at each concert. But that's what the calculation looks like for equal tension, but in reality, the, the strings that are at a higher tension, you know, there's a high percentage of their breaking strain. You have to say, well, um, you know, by the time they've uh, stretched and settled, they're a, a different diameter. So one way to compensate for that is to say that um, the string settling is equivalent to it uh, ha having a, a semitone change in pitch. Which means so that, and that's equivalent to about uh, six percent of the tension, um, and uh, and about say half of that for the A. And I don't think we really need to bother for the D and G. So uh, doing that calculation, I say instead of instead of selling the client a 0.6 millimeter string, I would uh, I would try and sell them a 0.64. Uh, but in, in reality, like, you know, your violin might have a, a very weak D, in which case you might decide to boost that one a little bit. Or you might feel, you might feel that even though I've uh, made that allowance on the E, it's still a bit weak. Or you might say my A shouts, you know, I, I'll, I'll, next time I replace the strings, I'll go for a little bit less. What's this one? You know, I've no idea what this bit here is now. Oh, I wonder what it is. This is the, um, I've written it there. It's the um, you know, an approximate maximum practical stringing you know, tensions for a violin. And uh, that type of thing is recorded um, historically as having been used. Uh, I think uh, Paganini had an E string that was about that, that sort of tension. 
but in fact uh, modern steel is uh, can be about nine kilograms but of course the the total tension is less because of the grading across you know, with a much lighter G uh, so the, what people will call a classical set uh, or transitional this is a kind of thing that people will do uh, so this this kind of thing is record um, was documented by a, a physicist and violinist called uh, Riccati, I think, in about um, 1765. Um, and a, a modern dominant set is um, looks looks like this. It's not so different, really. So if we, if we start by talking about all gut sets, um, what actually is the practical pitch range? Like the, if you're an angel playing the violone, you know, how how big does your violone need to be to, to effectively play a low pitch? Or what is the lowest pitch your violone could reasonably be tuned to? And on your lute, how high how high can you take the top string? So it's very clear that um, you know low pitches benefit from the length, and um, top strings are safer if they're not too long. So there's a, there's a limit to how long you can have your top string, and there's a limit to how short you can have your bottom string, and we can uh, we can quantify that. So I, I've invented something uh, in order to actually quickly work out if somebody proposes a, a particular stringing, I can tell you straight away whether it's practical and it's the number without a name. So if, if I type into my calculator, the frequency in Hertz, the length in centimeters and divide it by a thousand, I've got a, a kind of handy number that I can work with so if, for example, let, let's, let's try and set what is a practical um, number without a name for a violin top string. Um, and so we could look at a 19th century German violin with a 33.3 centimeter stop, which is quite common. Uh, we, don't do, we don't like them that long now, but at that time people did. And uh, sometimes the pitch standard in uh, Europe um, in the 19th century was as high as 454. So crank in the numbers with the number, number without a name and you get 22.65. So like just for, you know, let's take the extreme, let's say anything above 23 is not practical. But if it's 21 or 22, it's absolutely fine. It, the, the spring should last well enough. With the, with exception that say something like a, a long thin string on a, a five string cello, it doesn't sound all that nice. It can sound it can sound uncomfortably tense or, or whiny. It doesn't really have a very beautiful sound. Um, if I let's do the numbers on a, on this, so a big five string cello might well have had a um, seventy four centimeter stop. So some of them did say, say something like the Abati instruments or various various bass violins in the uh, early 1600s, and I get I get for that bottom C I get a 4.3, which I say I think is really quite good. So I would set the um, I think as you get much below four, then it starts to not work. It just it's all right if you've got time to prepare a note and it's a simple note and it hasn't got rapid bow changes you can get away with a lower number than that and, um, but let's look at the top string so in fact this also works out so it, you get 21.7 which is is really quite well within the within the range uh, and most of those in, instruments like say from the late 1400s where you start to get instruments with a uh, two octaves apart so like a vial tuning like it's in a d vial the the top string is uh, uh, the d two octaves above 
uh, but it's worse. So like on a five string instrument tuned in fifths, the, the, the difference in pitch between the top and bottom string is greater, but it's still, it's still a viable arrangement according to this. But um, one thing that people are constantly wanting to do is they want to get the small violoni, which really should be a G violoni, but they want to tune it in D. That's because conductors ask them to do it. But uh, it, it won't work in all that, like at, at 95 centimetres. It really is not uh, like 3.1. It, it's a groggy, annoying sort of thing. Whereas if you tune that, uh, tune that viol only in the G tuning, it sounds great. The, it would have a really good quality sound and it, it would it'd be better. But you know, it's difficult to talk people out of it. Uh, so I can turn, I can, you know, there's a bit of sophisticated algebra here. I can turn it round so I can say, well, I want, I have a particular um, number without a name that I'd like to match. What is the length that I need for that? So the answer really is to, if I want uh, uh, to get four, that bottom string, I need 115 and a half centimetres. And that's how big uh, D Vironis were. It was strung in all that. Pretorius is one, uh, it's been estimated to be about 128 centimetres. They're big instruments. But it, so if you must tune your G violoni down, down to D, you're going to have to have a wound string. And what is the limit for that? I don't know, but say uh, I, did, I did do the calculation for a, a viola C. Um, with a 37 centimeter stop, and that comes out at about 2.4. So I think the there again, that lower limit or how well it behaves depends on the construction of the string. So if you've got a very flexible core and quite a lot of winding, I think you can push that number down and the, the, the stiffer the stiffer the string, the, the higher it will be. So let's look, have a just a rest. Yeah, may I interrupt? There are a few of us getting lost. Could you go back to the previous uh, what you, slide? The what one before. About? The one before. Um, yes, I'm lost because you say that 22 is uh, satisfactory, but then 4 yes. is satisfactory too. But 3.1 is not. No, no, the 22.65 the, the is the top string. That's the upper limit, and the four is the lower limit. So, so the range is between. Hand, you can have. Sorry, the range is between four for the lower note and twenty-two for the higher notes. If you're looking here, this is a five-string cello. It says four C string. That's the bottom string. Yeah. With a frequency of fifty-eight point two four hertz. So the calculation gives me 4.3, which I say is okay. And for the top string, which is an E, yeah. above uh, higher than a normal cello A, with a um, frequency of 293.7, comes out at 21.7. That's also okay. Yeah, but so within, how do you de within safe limit. Yeah, how do you determine what, what is okay? I've done it uh, here. I, I'm taking an extreme of, uh, example of a violin. So uh, if you put a good quality gut string on your violin and tune it up, it doesn't break. You can tune it up a bit more and it still doesn't break. But the further up we go, the, the, the shorter its lifetime and there will come a point where you simply can't tune it up there in the first place. So what I'm saying is I'm making an estimate from this, from practical experience of where these limits lie. So I wouldn't really, I would prefer my violin to be not more than 22. It's just like I was surprised that four is okay, but not three. It doesn't seem that such a big change. And that's that's uh, established by practical experience. Okay. So uh, I've, I, I can tell you that simply it, it's not, there's no calculation. I mean, if I knew, if I had information on the rupture modulus of gut, I could tell you 
at what point it was at, say, you know, 60 or 80 percent of its breaking strain. I could tell you that information, but I don't have it. This is based on actual practical experience. So if people, if, if uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been playing violins um, with a string that pitch and that length, and it's okay, then we can say, yes, your instrument's okay to match that number. But likewise, when we come to what's satisfactory in, in, a, in a bass instrument or the bottom string, uh, that comes down to having actually strung a lot of instruments and work with musicians on, on the question. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my practical experience here. Okay. Nick, does, that, does that answer the question? I think it does. Um, Some, somebody's saying it's still lost, but then Fan replied, so I don't know if it's okay. So it just, I think it were, we wanted some clarification about this range and how you determine this range, but you have explained, so. It's practically- As I say, this is, this is practical work. I mean, the, the thousand here, it doesn't mean anything. It just means that I, I prefer looking at a number like, you know, with two, two digits and a decimal point than I do with, um, you know, a kind of five digit number because um, it confuses me. It's just easier to manage it. But it doesn't, it, but basically you're getting it by the, the product of the frequency and the length. That, that is that is how you're determining the the upper and lower limits is that clear thanks so so we're just going to look at some pictures now um this space is in in berlin and the um bottom two strings have been carbon dated to the late 18th century they are they're very highly twisted um, this picture, that's, uh, this, uh, I think it might be the same one with the angel in, you, you see how thick the, the bottom strings are compared to the top. And uh, interesting, they appear to me to be still a little bit translucent. Uh, this is a, a Pretorius, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's a, it's a, a vial. Uh, they even drawn the kind of hatching to show that the high twist of the string. Um, this is a, another very well known painting. Um, Mersen. And this same painting uh, is um, one of my clients who's written a book on the uh, Viola de Gamba. Has, has made up this picture. So she's taken a, a painting and her own vial strung in real gut strings with calculated e equal tension. So I, I, I think this is very persuasive. I mean, I think these pictures are clearly um, portraying equal tension stringing on the instruments. Even down to the details that the lower string looks quite dark, which they, they sometimes do. And it gets the top string, it's light color, which means it may be, maybe it's been put in the sulfur chamber uh, to improve its tensile strength. Hi, how do you, how do you yes. see that it's equal tension? You say it's pretty clear. How do you see it? How do I see it? I, I, well, I, I don't want to boast, but I have to say my eye has become very finely <laughs> tuned to diameter strings. So I can quite often look at an instrument and tell you what the diameter is without measuring it. So this, this set, the set on this one are ones that I've made and sold to Annette, Annette. So I know exactly what their diameters were. And this is the painting. So they look to me like very much the same sort of set. Ah, so you're, you're, basing, so you're basing your judgment on the diameter of the strings? Yes, I'm eyeballing, eye, eyeballing it. But I, I, I have to say I'm very good at that because I've had decades of experience doing it. Um, but I mean, if nothing else, I mean, just look at this one. So I wasn't going to introduce any of my daughters to this guy, but 
uh, but I am impressed with his uh, string on the, on this um, on his bass violin. That is thick, right? That's that's we're looking at a string like five millimeters thick there. So uh, these thick and and when actually the uh, picture I've got is a, a very, in very high resolution. You can zoom in and you can see the structure of the string and little whiskers on it in one or two places. It's a very, very detailed picture. So these, these thick high twist strings beyond any reasonable doubt uh, existed and were, were common. So what I've done is I've been involved, let's keep looking at them for a minute, I've been involved in what I call industrial archaeology reenactment. I've always been a fan of Tor Heyerdahl and his Contiki expedition. So people said, don't be an idiot, you can't sail across the Atlantic in that thing, or you can't do, go across to Polynesia from Ecuador. Um, but they were wrong, he could do it. He, he was wrong because actually the uh, genetic analysis has shown that these people didn't migrate from in the way he suggested. But uh, you can't say if you can actually do it, it's, it's no longer viable position to say that it's impossible. But I would say we, in, in terms of the enactment, we've made the strings, people are performing on them, and the results are actually very satisfactory and interesting. So you therefore can't, can't say that these things, you can't say, well, you know, I tried equal tension and all that and it didn't work. Well, all I can say is that they tried the inappropriate uh, construction of strings. Um, because the, the, the construction is all important and, and it makes a, a world of difference between what, whether you can actually use it for the purpose or not. But here, let's go a little bit technical for a moment. Uh, I think we've already had a little bit on, on the on the sawtooth wave and how it's composed of the harmonics. So the the more harmonics you add to it, the sh the sharper um, the sharper these little peaks become, and the, the more the ripples disappear. So uh, there are things that limit the sharpness of that um, peak. I I'm sure Jim would have some things to say about this. Uh, one of them is the finite width of the hair on the bow, which incidentally was narrower on historic bows than it is on modern ones. And another is the bending stiffness of the string. So if that string is very stiff, how can you possibly have a sharp kink in it? You can't. So uh, you'll have a string where uh, not only are the harmonics forced uh, upwards and out of tune with the fundamental, uh, but actually they won't, the string won't support the high harmonics properly and you'll end up with a nasty scratchy sound. And let's cut a sheep up now. So in this double stomach, and a bit more there, and 30 meters of uh, small intestine, they can do what we can't do. So what, what the sheep lack in intellect, they make up for in ability to digest cellulose. And, and this is why they have this amazingly long gut. It is a, a gift to string makers. And this uh, looks to me like a kind of a bit of high-tech tubing but the, the yellow bit here is the bit that interests us, is the submucosa. So it's a collagen tube, but when you take it out of the sheep, it has inside it this kind of gooey sort of uh, proteinaceous stuff that uh, you need, need to get rid of. It has no tensile strength, it has to go, and outside it's surrounded by muscle and uh, the whole thing wrapped in a, um, in a serosa. And this is a, a little slice through it. So the submucosa is, is round here. Um, and all the rest of it's got to go. We've got to scrape it away, wash it, put it through machines with rubber rollers and things. So they also 
taper. My, my gut supplier is a guy who left school at 15. And he, he says sheep are, are wedge shaped. What he means is they taper. So particularly towards the, the thicker end where it uh, comes from the stomach, it gets, it gets fat and flabby and the uh, protein fibers and molecules are orientated circumferentially around there, but further down the string, they're more uh, axial. So we tend for string baking, we, we want to tend to discard that bit there because it's not even enough but we can use uh, all the rest of it, particularly this bit, because it's more, the tube is more parallel, it's, it's better suited for, uh, for string making. But we sometimes split, split it into a left, left and a right half. So the, the left side is the side that, uh, where the serosa is and it's anchored into the, what's called the mesoteric skirt, it, it, it keeps the, intestines from just getting jumbled up and tied in knots but it's a bit bit rougher it has more more holes but it's very elastic so it makes very good uh, small strings things like violin d strings or lute basses and the right side is is better for trebles but we are increasingly keeping the whole tube now but uh, this is typically what happens when you split a string we get a little thread or trace of um, tr trace of serosa that is sometimes still there, but mostly it's removed in the cleaning process. And of course, the right side is longer than the left. And uh, this is about twist. So the, the solution really to making strings uh, um, flexible and, and, and elastic has simply been to do with the uh, the locus of the components in in the string so uh, getting high as high a twist as is possible um, I call it the toilet roll model simply because well you know suitable humor for the topic if you envisage a pair of strands that are actually down the center of the string and then another set that are wrapped in a spiral around the outside if I then rotate the whole tube, I think it's clear that you can see immediately that the ones on the outside of the tube will tighten a great deal more than the two in the middle. That's because their, their, change, their change in their path links is much greater than for the ones in the middle. So if I just get a bundle of gut, what will happen is as I start to twist it, the ones on the outside will become tighter than the ones in the middle. And in so far as it's possible, they'll migrate into the string and squeeze other ones out. So up to a point that the structure is self self sorting, but there comes a, a point where it, it won't hold and suddenly the string will go like a corkscrew. And once that's happened, the, there's, there's no way back. But if you put structuring into the string, which imposes order on where the where the components are, you can go to a much higher one. So if, for example, I take take a, a bunch of guts, I put a little bit of twist in it, then double it back and retwist it. Well, then I've halved the amount of area where that uh, where the gut can migrate to, uh, uh, force them into some kind of structure. Or better still, I make it up out of these six pieces. So um, you know, a six ring made out of um, three pairs and it's a very large number sometimes for a thick string. I call this renaissance salami so if I if I put a very high twist in the components uh, it comes out lumpy like, like a ship's rope but if I control the amount of twist into the into the subcomponents I can end up with a, a, a a nice cylinder, smooth cylinder, but still with a very high level of twist. Because I, I can push the twist much, much further if I use this type of construction. And um, in rope construction, what, what's known as an ordinary lay, this, this is a steel, a steel cable. Uh, what has happened is they've wrote, um, say if you're looking from, from one end, if you imagine 
the components been uh, assembled with an um, anti-clockwise twist, then you put together the rope with a clockwise twist, you get what's called an ordinary lay. So this would be very good for a cable set used with a crane, because as you put um, tension on it, it won't tend to um, untwist, because the reverse twist in, in the assembly uh, actually holds it together. In this one called Langsley, instead of the uh, components being on the outside being more axial, they, they run the other way because you've assembled it. So if you've twisted the uh, components clockwise and assembled them clockwise, the parts on the outside are more perpendicular uh, to the axis. And that's, a, in my mind, this is a better construction for strings. Uh, because we're, we're not lifting a load on a crane, they don't untwist in, in, in use. And anyway, they're kind of self-adhesive, so it doesn't, it's not an issue. Um, so let's actually make some strings now. So uh, the, the sheep come from the abattoir. Uh, they've, been, they've been cleaned, uh, packed in salt, and I, I wash them out, I put them in potash solution uh, and they over over about eight or ten days they're, they're washed and brought into a state of extreme hydration and I have uh, some chemical treatments uh, that I believe are historical but I, I'm not going to talk about it because it's it's top secret um, you hope when you're handling them that you don't get knots uh, you, if you get a bad tangle that can waste an awful lot of time. But, uh, and it's worse when, when you're working with uh, very long pieces. It's also a problem with the split gut. It, it gets to be very difficult to handle, very, very annoying. Um, so this is gut in a very hydrated state. And it's been, the tube has been opened out into a ribbon, washed for several days and th through uh, other kind of careful treatments. And then, uh, if I want to open it into a ribbon, it can be done very simply with a stick, a stick and a razor blade. So this little tight bit there is the left edge, uh, and that was the, the part that was attached to the mes mesoteric skirt. Uh, so there's a tight edge and a flappy bit, flappy bits around it. And then if I want to, um, split it into left and the right, I have what's called a splitting horn. Uh, and around here, these little lugs out there, I call them finger retainers, so, so that you don't touch the razor blades while you're working, because when you've got wet hands and things, it's a, a nuisance to get a cut, especially if you take anticoagulants. Uh, it's a little bit further away. And then they come into separate trays. And here we are actually making a string. So on, on the left is uh, my colleague, o o Ollie Weber, who is a professional Baroque violinist and has been working with me making strings since about 1995. Uh, that's Jane, on the left is Jane Julia, who was with us for that session. So we, we're, we're going to make a big string now. So here, mostly, um, when I work as a team with with Ollie, I always do the the laying out and the knot tying because I've got to be very fast at that. And he's he can count the turns and talk while he's doing. You know, he can multitask on that one and keep right the records down. Um, so here we're going to make a thirty six strand um, violoni string. So we've set out. Um, I think that's 18 pairs of, uh, of strings and it starts out nearly two meters long. What am I doing for time? I'm doing pretty well. So the first step is to, is to put some twist in the pairs. Then we take each of those ones and then make, pair them up again. So we now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, which, um, groups, each of which contain four strings, four strands, 
and a certain number of turns. Now I take those into three sets of three. We then twist those uh, together and we then at that, at this stage, we collect them all together on one great big spring. And then we... And on the right is Jane Achtman, who some of you may know is a um, vile yellow gamba player. This is the the technical name for this is Tobler rolling. Yeah. And then I'm gonna try and make the uh, Oh Jane. Jane, I'm just hearing Oh sorry, yes. <laughs> well I was happy to take it off anyway, so we ended up red, but that's the That's it. So you can ask lots of questions now. If you want. Thank you, Georgia. So who would like to ask a question? Do you hear me? We've included all kinds of other things. Yes. You hear me? Can't see you. I can hear you. Okay. Oh, but uh, I, yeah. I just want a uh, fantastic presentation. And uh, interesting to see that you do, are you working with hand tools and it could have been done 300 years ago or even more in the same way. Uh, I wonder how, how much. No complicated equipment, no rope walks or any crap like that. Very simple. Uh, how much does, uh, does the uh, 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 press uh, string there from the movie Shrink? Uh, it cost me, uh, um, I have to pay about three pounds for uh, a like that. Yeah. But but I, I, want, actually I, buy, I have. Yeah. Uh, I, but I wonder, uh, it's full of water when you produce the first, uh, or, or what we saw in the movie there. But uh, it, it will. It, it should uh, shrink somewhat when you uh, when the when it gets dry. And how much does it shrink? Oh, a lot. Like that string, you can start off with a string that's about a centimeter in diameter, but when it's dry, it's about four millimeters. That's so a typically, a thirty-six strand string will be um, anywhere between three point nine and four point six depending on the, on the size of the uh, gut that you work with. Okay. Thank so you. that is one of the biggest problems is hitting target diameters. Like you, okay. you can't, you, um, I mean, it's, a, it's against our rules to um, polish it down, like to, to make it oversized and then polish down to a specific diameter because we don't, I think that wrecks the quality of the string. So we basically they only get surface polishing. So um, deciding, uh, selecting the gut and uh, organizing it. So you get the a range of diameters from, uh, you know, to meet the re requests. It, it's very difficult. Okay. So I think this is why in a sense, the, the idea of um, Exact uh, exact diameter matching and, and, and your stringing is a bit crazy. 
I think people must have tolerated a certain amount of error. So that's why I call things like the equal tension a principle rather than something you can actually always adhere to, even if you want, however much you want to. So it, it suggests people like Leopold Mozart is suggesting you actually have to have access to a lot of string and you have to balance them, you have to uh, sort through them and test them until you get uh, ones that match. This is very, very different from buying strings today. Yeah, and I guess this is material that is, uh, the raw material is just thrown away uh, anyway, they don't use it or? Sausage skins. Oh yeah. <laughs> No, it, there's a big international trade. I mean, it's make, it's harder for me to get uh, guts now because I'm in competition with an international trade in, in sausage skins, or casings, they're called, okay. in English. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, Abbas? Thank you. You have to turn on your microphone. You were too noisy, so I had to mute you. Was, was, uh, I'm sorry. Thanks, George. That was really uh, good. I was waiting for this all week. Um, <laughs> now you can leave. <laughs> you can <laughs> yeah, go back. Right. <laughs> no, I was just wondering, but you have an idea um, why the, 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 the principle of this equal tension was abandoned at some point? Is it, is it violinistic reasons or um, technical reasons? Well, I think what, what happened it hasn't been abandoned because I, I, I proved to you that uh, modern sets are, are actually sometimes the other way around. They're more in the bass than in the top. Yes, so for the violins. That's why I showed you the, the violins. Well, I, I think the, the, the fact of uh, the, the taller bridge, a larger bass bar, the taut bow and things, it's kind of worked out for the violin. But uh, violas are less, uh, less unequal and, and cellos, it doesn't it's not doesn't really apply it's a different a different logic for uh, cello tension sets i think the what happened in the early music business was something really stupid basically that when people became interested again in in this um, in react reenacting historical performance they looked at the last time violins were strung in guts so they were looking at the kind of set that uh, chrysler used which is not really very different from the, the, the classical set that I showed you. So they looked at those sorts of sets and then they applied that because the luthiers were violin centric. They applied that principle to stringing viola de gamba. Uh, and so they were stringing them with uh, overspun basses, uh, which are, are subjectively louder. So that makes some kind of sense, but they also, didn't really have the alternatives because uh, the type of uh, high twist gut that I'm making stopped being available quite, really quite some time ago. Although I have uh, I have uh, one cello string and one um, violin D string that's almost identical that are taken off old instruments, and I think they date from you know possibly around about 1950. Possibly they could be pre-Second World War, I don't know, but they're made in a multi-twist construction. So then there are nine component uh, pieces where, where each each of the three subcomponents is made out of two small ones and one thicker one. So the small pair is twisted, then that pair is twisted with the thicker one, and then three so constructed ones are put together. Now this is, there's no record anywhere in, in about this being a practice in string making. But but it's interesting to see that that recently um, structured strings of that type were still in production. Do you know so where it's I think unfortunately, sorry. Do you know where that string was made? You have an idea? I don't, I don't know, but I, I would think it would probably either either Italy or Germany that would be my guess. Uh, so it's the, the fact of the unavailability of suitable gut that kind of pushed people into, into another kind of philosophy. And it, it's stuck. It's been, people just do not understand that uh, 
that, that um, a that the um, evidence says otherwise, and that it's actually possible to do it. I, I personally find it very annoying, and I, I kind of I'm sort of creeping away from the business, as it were, just because I don't find the work so satisfactory. So I, I put decades in trying to in trying to show that people that you can do it, and making instruments, being as faithful as I can to the information. Yet there's still new people coming into the business. They're being taught in their conservatoires uh, things that are complete rubbish. I, I exaggerate a bit. It's maybe not that bad, but um, I, I just feel it disappointing that we haven't got, um, you know, people haven't caught up with what is uh, possible and what is known and then develop from that. Like you're still kind of fighting the battle of saying, no, you know, all gut strung uh, viola, viola de gambas were in equal tension. Here's one that's strung this way. It's fantastic. Sounds amazing. Yet yeah, you've still got to keep fighting that same battle over and over again. And I, I'm bored with it now. So you're saying they, they were in equal tension, yeah? Just like there was they a. They were. Of course case. they were. Yeah. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming, and the practical results are are wonderful. Yet you're still you're still fighting the battle, and it's stupid. People still vote for Trump. <laughs> well, let's not go. Oh, sorry, that's off. That's off limits, isn't it? <laughs> I'll, I'll walk that back. <laughs> okay. Uh, fun as a question. Um, Bas, do you want to ask me as a question? No, it's okay. Thanks. Okay. Fun. Yeah. Um, George, so <clears throat> this whole topic is, is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, there are so many aspects of it, you know, for different eras, time, geographic, you know, geographical regions and, and, and um, um, instruments. So there's no time to get into the specific details, but um, I wanted to um, ask you a question about one aspect of it, um, which is, um, more recently, um, with respect to modern instrument stringing, you know, because the historical evidence is that um, uh, for at least for violins, the tensions were quite high um, through the end of the um, 19th century. And somehow during the 20th century, um, after World War II, modern gut strings, which are very low twist gut strings, by the way, you know, uh, um, not the high twist gut strings that George um, is uh, talking about here. Um, modern gut strings, uh, low twist gut strings became the, um, the norm and with very low tensions because you, you can't, um, um, they could not be uh, played, uh, used at high tensions because uh, they're so stiff. I mean, what, what, what happened in the, uh, during the 20th century? Do you have any idea? I think one of the things is that the, the gut market was driven by the need for cores for wound strings. Mm -hmm. So people were using a, a metal E at the top of the instrument, uh, maybe a, an uncovered a, gut A, mm -hmm. but they were using, well, I mean, pre-World War I, uh, uh, all the violinists used, uh, they, all the strings were um, plain gut except for the G sort of a round wound one. But I think post-war, um, probably they were looking to, to make the production cheaper, also moving to the use of beef serosa rather than sheep gut, uh, and um, adding uh, adhesives to the, to the gut when they, as they assembled it, like uh, uh, you know, the worst one is wallpaper paste. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons for doing that is probably that they were starting to use uh, centerless grinders to, to, to so-called rectify the strings. So the uh, uh, great thing about the centerless grinder is you can very quickly pass the string through it. It'll come out the other end with quite a good finish on it and very perfectly cylindrical. Mm -hmm. But it's a kind of losing battle. Like it's what, what I call pissing into the wind. You know, yeah. you. On the one hand, you get yourself a perfect cylinder. On the other hand, you've increased the bending stiffness and you've made it much more vulnerable to, to being hairy as it's being handled. So I think on the one hand, the kind of volume 
and accuracy of the production was improved and the accuracy of diameter is very important when you're making wound strings but in other ways some of the things that make up such a good material for for musical strings some of those things were being lost yeah the, the do you think that the two world wars had a factor because uh, you know it seems to me that it's possible that the uh, devastation of the uh, two world wars in europe uh, possibly you know um um, killed off a lot of people with the expertise in making high twist, you know, or... Well, I think there's that. There's the actual, actual death of people who knew how to do it. But, but there's also, yeah. I think, probably stronger factors, the economic things in, in that perhaps during the war periods, they couldn't actually operate their factories or they may be uh, forced to do some other kind of um, military-related activity. As, um, as, as Suzuki the famous Dr. Suzuki in the Second World War, his, um, his violin factory made um, floats for um, water landing aeroplanes. And then at the end of the war, he went back to the, the violin production. But I, I, but I think at the end, you know, the, the whole thing of a war, it needs a big reset and people emerge from the other side. And I think, you know, I really need to think, rethink my business. What do I do? Who are my target clients? What, what should the product be? I think there's yeah, so, probably that is probably the biggest factor. Yeah, so so one of the things I, I, I want to really emphasize, and I'm not sure that George, you know, you emphasize this enough in your talk, because, you know, I come from this, um, um, not only as a string designer, but as a player, is that the, um, the, the, um, the effects of tensions on the playability and the way you bow is absolutely dramatic. And, um, and so, there are huge, tremendous differences between, um, you know, um, let's say um, strings at nine pound tension, which, which still many of the Baroque players are using, you know, low twist gut strings versus, this is for, for example, a violin A string versus the uh, 12 and a half pound tensions of modern synthetic core strings versus perhaps the 15 pound um, string tensions um, that George is referring to in the Baroque era, but we, it's, but those are the string tensions that Paganini was using. And, um, and so... Yes, Paganini had two string tensions for different musical purposes. Or yes, okay, yeah, that's another uh, complicating fa factor, uh, but... The, the, the Canoni, I, I doubt that that sounds any good with the light stringing on it. I think that that's, um, you know, it's... Uh, strong instrument it needs, it would have to be heavily strong, I would think. Yeah, so, 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 so one thing that we can say is that even though there, there are no universal um, string tensions, stringing for all eras and, and periods, um, the, 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 the so-called modern low tension gut stringing is, is definitely not, not um, historically authentic, um, except perhaps for, you know, a few cases. So, so, um, the, um, you know, if it affects the way we bow and play the instrument and the, and the way the, um, the instrument sounds. And um, because I, I had the privilege of, of playing uh, one of George's um, uh, Baroque violins um, strung up this way. And um, I can tell you that initially for the first 15 minutes, it was the weirdest experience I have ever had. But um, after about playing on it for about an hour, I began to realize that it was, you know, the, um, its qualities. And, um, and then going back to a modern violin, um, the modern violin then for the next 15 minutes uh, um, felt completely weird. So um, I highly encourage um, people to actually, if they have the time and interest to explore this whole, this whole area, you know, this whole um, subject matter. It's, it's absolutely fascinating and, and has, huge implications on historical performance practices. And I would say not just the performance practices of the Baroque era, but even the uh, historical performance practices of, let's say, uh, uh, Chrysler and, and um, uh, Heifetz when they were very young, you know, 100 years ago. Because I, I'm convinced that some of the differences in the sound they produced were, were actually due to using very different strings. Um, even a hundred years ago. I think that's absolutely true. 
And you know, um, I, I didn't. I, I think I forgot to uh, read that topic about um, you know, the idea that light string, light stringing, is easier to play. I think it, there's some generalities about it in, in that perhaps if you want uh, some dynamic range, it's easier to achieve that with uh, lighter strings. But then there's an upper limit. So in the shell in force diagram, the um, the upper limit is actually controlled by the string tension. So uh, a heavily strung instrument allows you to use a lot of bowing force, but it perhaps means that it's less easy to manage the quiet dynamics. But I don't really think that was a feature of Baroque playing. I don't think they were interested in subtle gradations of, um, of dynamics. I think they had strong notes and weak notes, and they had different articulations for the bowing. But the the type of uh, playing that uh, has evolved in a, a modern style is is very very different, and and our modern strings and setup is is suited for that. Yeah, so so I would say that you know one of the uh, many, but the, one of the most important critical differences is in the as you point out is the, in the articulation, and um, mm -hmm. um, between because with the the much um, higher tension stringing, of course. It's it's more difficult to get going uh, the string going. You have to kick it a bit more. So, um, but the benefit of that is that um, um, the articulation becomes much more important. And um, and certainly um, in the Baroque era, um, the the articulation um, sort of the consonance of the sounds was much more important. I think with modern playing, with the invention of the modern bow. Uh, you know, it emphasizes the legato. I have, I have a theory about this, that the unequal tension on the violin was actually in imitation of bel canto singing style. Oh, uh, I totally agree so with you. In bridges, like uh, much uh, taller bridges with more wood in the top and very small lower ankles. I think when I've made instruments set up like that, they're, they're a bit short on articulation. They're kind of warm and, and uh, somehow quite easy to play with a with a uh, taut type bow there's little distinction between an up bow and a down bow in a sense they eradicated articulation from the style and they focused on sort of cantilena techniques on the g-string yeah and long long phrases in the same bow on on the other strings but i think come about 1800 people started to turn around and think oh uh, that was fun but actually i'm missing i'm missing some of that grit from the from the baroque Type setups, and and I think the modern, more modern thing has has backed off from that uh, that uh, aesthetic objective. Thank you so much, George. Uh, you're welcome. We could talk about this forever. I mean, I know. <laughs> so I'll stop so now. Much, so much to talk about. Thank you, thank you, Fan, for your relevant uh, comments and and. Thank you. Yes, that's been made many uh, helpful conversations. You've helped me say things that I was otherwise find difficult to put into the presentation. Uh, there is, I can see a question by Francesco. Would you like to ask it uh, personally, Francesco? Here I am. Hi, George. Hello, Francesco. Which set of strings do you suggest were used for the Messiah where we have found a string length of less than 320 millimeters? Well, I would say the, the the something like the Baroque set that I suggested was about. Um, I would think it would have been strung with something like six or seven kilograms per string, roughly. So the, these were these instruments, you know, in their original state, were were not delicate. I mean, they had. This is why there's kind of extra wood left around the platforms and things. And we tend to think that uh, we need more wood in the island to resist the string tension. But of course they had bridges that only like uh, less than 27 millimeters high, often like 25 millimeters. So although you might say the neck set is not different from modern ones, the projection certainly was. So the, the downward resolution in the island area wasn't very great. They had a smaller base bar and a lower bridge. So you end up maybe with a similar um, uh, rotational admittance um, to, to a modern one. 
but I would say that that was the is uh, that it's possible for the, the time of the Messi that uh, that he might have used a wound G string. So I think what one of the clues to that is the uh, increased use of um, ebony veneered finger walls. So if you use a um, a wound string on a on a maple fingerboard, it'll quite quickly chew into the wood and mess it up. Whereas the ebony veneer will will cope with it a lot better. So uh, I think certainly some instruments used um, a wound G string. And then, but uh, some of the pictures, like uh, from France, indicate perhaps that the uh, a bottom string in sort of close wound was open wound. So that's a kind of in between sort of thing between uh, in close wound and uh, unwound at all. But even when they're wound, as I said before, the, there's more core and less winding, and it, it's a modern concept to try and maximise the mass added by uh, by the the winding and make the push the core to as far as you dare towards its breaking point. I mean Fan can tell you a lot about that in modern string design. So but it's uh, you have different issues for the bottom string than you do for something like a, a covered A string. You know, they're, they're different uh, different problems in, in for each string. But I, I feel pretty confident that all the Stradivari instruments were quite, quite robustly strong. And then come later, come you know, the 19th century, where, uh, or actually around about 1800, um, so stringing in, in Germany became very, very light for a while. And I think some probably people felt that some of these Italian instruments or, and other German instruments were too robust and they got uh, regraduated. So, but it happens now that the, the most highly valued of the old Cremonese instruments are the ones that didn't get regraduated. Probably things like the Vieton del Gesù, with all its glorious 2.7 millimeters. So now people, it's swung the other way that those are the instruments favored by soloists. But maybe not the easiest instrument to play. So, like if you're, um, an amateur, you're probably happier with a, a, a thinner, a thinner top, uh, and just a bit more manageable. Does that answer the question? I will yes. place an order. Anything else, George? Uh, could you just clarify something you mentioned slightly uh, earlier, which is the uh, difference between the rotational admittance of a high bridge versus a low bridge and the uh, base bar as well? That were you saying? Yeah, so if you imagine, like if you imagine you super glue a stick to the middle of the uh, center joint of the violin in the bridge position, and you could move it. So the rotational admittance is a function of how the kind of actual sort of stiffness that, that it is, how, how resistant it is to rotation and the right. length. Right. I mean, so the the taller the bridge, the, the lower the um, resistance, so the, the admittance goes up. But a, in a Baroque bridge that's lower, uh, actually by making, reducing that rotational stiffness, see, by, by having a small base bar, it kind of balances out, so you still end up getting some depth of sound out of the instrument. I've always so, thought. I mean, this is something that can't be emphasised too much. In that, when you set up an instrument with historic stringing, you need to look at all the other things. You need to look at not only the strings. You need to look at the bow, the bass bar, the tailpiece, the type of neck and fingerboard, and and, and of course the bow. So yeah. it, it's a package. People want to mix and match. Uh, and it often doesn't work out. So that's why I say, I think you need to immerse yourself in the culture and the information and, and just follow it as, as faithfully as you can. And this way you get the most interesting results. I've been, I've always thought- You could look at the evidence. Yeah. yeah. I've I mean, always thought you about- You can look at the historical evidence. <laughs> sure. 
you say it, then I'll speak. <laughs> All right. No, I've always thought of the rotational admittance as only pertaining to the bridge, but of course it's, it, it pertains to the whole cross section of the or the whole instrument for that matter. Um, not just the bridge, but the, also the whole corpus at that, you know, at that position. Base bar yes. cell. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could spend a whole week talking about uh, admittance and, and its significance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, I can't remember. Oh, yes, I, I mean, um, yes, this is another thing is you can go through, if you're a kind of a bit perverse, you, you can go through the historical evidence and the pictures and you can try and say, oh, look, there's a tall bridge. That stringing looks light. Um, and, and you can kind of put together a, a set of an alternative reality and say, well, actually, you know, my modern violin is not so different. Why, do, why am I messing around with all this Baroque nonsense? But that's, that's kind of missing the whole point of uh, historically informed performance because the evidence for these low bridges and uh, reasonably heavy stringing, it's so overwhelming that that seems to be you know, it, it, that is the area to explore if you want to understand, if you want to get to the root of what the uh, um, differences in performance practice and aesthetics were. Mm -hmm. So to try and dodge it uh, by um, cherry picking from the evidence to me is, is just downright perverse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you on a motorbike? What? You have a motorbike. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's got everything. Ah, oh, British. Ma Marty has a question. Marty, you have to unmute yourself. George, why sheep? Why not cows or goats or something else? Well, goats are fine. Uh, in, in Morocco, in, in Essaouira, for example, they would say, you're bad to use sheep. There's nothing, uh, you know, goat is the stuff to use. Sheep are for eating, goats are for strings and um, drum heads and uh, heads for, uh, you know, um, string instruments with, with a diaph stretched diaphragm. And, and they do use cow, but they don't actually use the, the submucosa of the cow. Uh, for some reason, they, they use the serosa. Um, so a lot of that comes from uh, Latin America, from Brazil, places uh, as the source. Uh, but what this uh, serosa of the cow is quite big, uh, and normally it's supplied cut into into ribbons. They have special machines with multiple rot rotating blades, so it's convenient for string makers. But I, I think it may sometimes slightly uh, excel sheep gut in tensile strength, but it tends to make strings that are less, less elastic and flexible. So most, uh, most gut strings now are beef serosa, not sheep. And there are quite a lot of historical string makers who basically deceive uh, us about um, what they're using. So they might put a picture of sheep on the website, but actually they're using beef serosa. It's not a crime. I mean, it's not even necessarily the case that beef serosa was never used historically. I think it probably was. But there's something special about sheep. There's a, a kind of warmth and bloom to the sound that uh, nothing, nothing else quite, quite matches. Does that answer your question? I mean, you can use pig. I mean, pig gut uh, was, was used at one time for ship's ropes, but it's horrible to work with. It's really sort of knobbly and lumpy and chunks of fat stuck to it. And it isn't, hasn't got very good tensile strength. So a sheep is particularly good for its smoothness and elasticity. I think there's another question. No, it doesn't seem like, so probably time to 
Finish. Uh, Harris, Harris, Can I ask? Uh, ah, yes, yes, okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I just, uh, I'm just reading a book from uh, the bookshop in uh, Museo del Violino in Cremona. Uh, they have, um, um, they have some strings uh, from Stradivari's workshop there. Uh, the, the article is named MS222 and um, it says these four strings are the thickness for finishing the viola of four strings, namely the contralto viola. So we have an indication that Stradivari was uh, also providing the exact strings for the instrument. Uh, could this be related yes, to... It's conceivable that he won the strings in his workshop. Okay, so uh, 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 does this imply that uh, gut strings, uh, you have to choose the, the, the thickness of the strings for uh, uh, the exact uh, model you are making? Um, well, that's suggesting that Stradivari had, had an opinion about what was the correct string for that instrument. Okay, but is, um, is this I would thought it was more general than that. I mean, he would say these strings are suitable for contralto violas in general. Okay, okay, I see. Rather than saying this particular viola must have this string, but say you bought this string from, this bought this viola from him, and maybe you live in England, uh, what are you going to do when you need a new string? Well, he's saying, well, this is, this is what it should be like. Okay, okay. Thank you. I think it's quite common, even musicians sometimes wound strings. There's something from uh, Oxford Music Society in the, um, the early 1700s where they bought, I think they were bought silver, silver plated copper from, uh, from the barber. So as you know, in, in Spain, a, bar a barber is still called a peluqueria. So barbers dealt with wigs as, as well as um, cutting your hair and shaving your beard. And they were uh, a source of um, silver plated copper. And people took that and they wound it on the string themselves. And, and that's quite difficult to do. Uh, there's a picture in the Diderot Encyclopedia of it being done with a, with a big wheel turning, to, you know, uh, and then they're using a piece of, of uh, something like chamois leather to hold the, uh, hold the um, wire in place as they wind it onto the string. So it's, it's quite difficult, and there were a lot of problems with wound strings, of the string of the one becoming loose and buzzing. So this is the reason why, um, you know, it didn't immediately uh, wipe out uh, plain gut, because people still like the aesthetic of, of plain gut, and um, you know there were technical problems with the, with the wound strings. George, I have a question on the age of gut strings. Can you, age? Yes. Uh, if, if, yes, I hear. You. Yeah, if the string is unplayed and kept in the original package and stored in controlled conditions like temperature and humidity, do, does the stink string degrade? Well, you know, there used to be, people used to say that, like, you know, if I, if I kept uh, Pirastro strings in stock, people, some people come in and say, how long have they been in stock? And they didn't want one if they thought I'd had it for um, a couple of years. It, in my experience uh, with my own gut, really, it doesn't degrade at all. You could keep it for many years. And sometimes people use the same string for more than 10 years on an instrument the string will actually last that long. Uh, however, I think some, I think the origin of this is that some string making processes led to the string becoming very brittle. Now I can't name the person involved, but I, I can tell you that, that somebody uh, handled the um, Paganini string that's in the Metropolitan Museum of New York and it broke. Oh, which is how it Do you hear me? Uh, you froze just for a moment, but an interesting answer. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think, that's, I think that the, the answer to that is that it has happened that some string making processes, perhaps something to make the string stronger or this, that or the other, has over time has made led, led to it becoming brittle. But uh, in my experience of the, my own string making, this is not the case. Yeah. Well, specifically, I was asking about uh, Pier Astro brand, and they probably do a pretty good job of cleaning and and uh, flushing out all the chemicals from the gut. Well, I, I never had that problem. I thought it was just a, a kind of misplaced anxiety. But I, but I think the this anxiety about the age of the gut ha does have some kind of origin uh, in some reality. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.